Anybody know how fast uh, the Grinch's sleigh can go? Yeah? It's max speed. His dog. Today we're starting a brand new series called Tiny Heart, where our goal is to grow out of Grinchiness. Anybody remember anything about the story of the Grinch at all? How many of you are familiar with the story? Okay, some of you, some of you not familiar. We'll try to bring you up to speed. Um, the, the Grinch is somebody who is so mean, so hateful, so cranky. Why? Why is he cranky? Anybody? Okay, he's lonely. Yes, he's lonely. But what's going on inside of him? Does anybody know the story? His heart's too small. Two sizes too small. Right? And so he, he's kind of this unkind, selfish, miserable kind of character. And so he makes it his goal to, uh, <laughs> to make his life and the lives of those around him just completely and totally miserable. Right? So he comes up with this plan to destroy Christmas for the who's in Whoville, who love Christmas a lot. But uh, his plan is by he's going to go in on Christmas Eve and steal their Christmas from them. However, by the end of the story, the tables have turned, and the Grinch is so completely overwhelmed by the love and goodness and kindness of the who's in Whoville that his heart goes from being two sizes too small to growing to the place where it's two sizes too big as a result of seeing how it is that their joy wasn't affected by having their stuff stolen. Uh, he be, ends up being a compassionate, selfish, selfless Grinch. Becomes a great example. Yes? I like it. I don't know how many of you are at this place, but I've had to watch the state of my heart over the last couple of years. How many of you would say there have been times over the last couple of years, for no reason, uh, that maybe you've, your heart's just been a little more grinchy than you would like to admit? Yeah, yeah, raising it high, high and proud, owning it, owning it. If, if we're not careful when the world is in chaos and, and there's all sorts of ups and downs and there's difficulties and people are frustrated and cranky, if we're not careful, our heart begins to align with them. And then, unfortunately, we become a part of the problem. Our heart is so important. Agreed? Above all else, guard your heart, for it affects everything that you do. Everything. Guard it. Make sure that your heart is right. Why? Because everything flows from it. Now, the Hebrew word that we're talking about here isn't the little bump, 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 heart, right? This is talking about the word nephes, which means your soul. This is your mind, your will, your emotions, your passion, your character. This is the whole, the core essence of who it is that you are. You better guard it. You better watch it. It's, it. My heart is the center of my being. Therefore, your heart, if it's, if it's shriveled and dry and crusty, your life is going to be a reflection of that. Right? Look at our next verse from Proverbs 27. As a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects a person. The Bible says that that. In your heart, who you are in your heart is who it is that's reflected into your life. The Bible says that, that what's in your heart is the most important thing about you. It, it determines who you are and affects everything that you do. The, the, another translation calls it the wellspring of life. Tiny shallow heart, tiny shallow life. So, what creates... A tiny heart. What is it? Right? I think it's probably two things. It's actually probably the two things that would create an unhealthy tiny heart. 
is the same two things that create an unti- a, 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 a tiny, unhealthy heart. And that is impurities and lack of activity. Just, just like our heart shrivels if we pollute it or don't exercise it, our soul shrivels if we pollute it and don't put it to work. The great news is that God is in the business of purifying hearts and putting them to work. He, he takes my heart, which isn't pure, which is full of like mixed motives, bad intentions, impure thoughts, uh, dysfunction. The Bible calls it sin, right? And we ask him to make it pure, and God has this ability. He's kind of like the Brita for the soul. God is the life straw for our life. He helps us to learn our true identity, one that is good and right and pure and loving and selfless. Can God really do that, though? Can, can he take something that is pure and make it pure again? Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. How, how is it that God can do that? Well, it's easy as ABC. ABC. Thank you. You win. Starts with A. First of all, I got to admit. Admit that my heart is not pure. I have to admit that there's something going on inside of there that isn't completely pure. Now, this is hard. How many of you know it's hard to admit when your heart isn't pure? Some of you don't even want to raise your hand about it. Okay, maybe I'll make it a little easier for you then. If you don't even want to raise your hand, here's what I'd like you to do. Turn to somebody beside you and say, my heart's not pure. Okay, I noticed that most of you just turned to somebody that you came with. Now I'd like you to make eye contact with somebody who doesn't know you. Go ahead, make eye contact. Have that awkward moment. Now look at them and say, my heart's not pure. Okay, now everybody tell them why. Go. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, you don't have to do that. <laughs> it's difficult to admit that there's more going on inside than we would like to let other people know about. That our thoughts, our desires are not always pure. But if you want to develop a pure heart, then the first step really is to admit that there are some things in there that need to change. There's some things going on inside of you. We have to admit it to ourselves, maybe to others, definitely to God. And, and the problem is so many people don't actually want to admit that there's something going on inside. But in, until you admit the problem, there exists no solution. Until you admit the problem... There isn't a solution for what it is that's going on inside of you. It's, it's, it's like when you go to Alcoholics Anonymous. If someone there has a drinking problem, the very first they, thing that they encourage them to do, hi, my name is Frank, I'm an alcoholic. They admit that they have a struggle that's going on inside of them. Why? Because they want them to find a solution. You see, the Bible is clear. We all have impure hearts. Every one of us, church leaders, the holiest people that you can ever think of in the world, none of us is perfect. If you have... Uh, I'm wrestling whether I should say it, and even after I said it in the last service, I wish I hadn't. The tiniest, the tiniest amount of poop wrecks the soup. Would you agree? The tiniest little dollop dropped into the soup wrecks the soup. <laughs> I don't know. It's the best analogy I could come up with. See, Paul goes on to tell us the ramifications of the tiniest little dollop of sin in our life. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Wages are something that you earn. And, and when you choose to have an impure heart, 
What it is that you earn from that is death. As a person sows, so shall they reap. Tiniest little dollop of poop. If you eat the soup, bad news for you. But the implications of living a life with an impure heart, it's devastating. Death means separation from God, both in our daily lives and for eternity. But even more serious than that, our impure hearts, they they keep us from experiencing the fullness of what it is that God has originally created us for. That you can waste your entire life. And that's pretty serious. Look at this verse, Matthew 5.8. It says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure. Why? Could you read it out loud for me? Why? For they will see God. I love this verse because it says if we have pure hearts, we're going to see God. We're going to see God working in our life. We're going to see God working around us. We're going to see God working through us. We'll be able to understand where it is that he's leading us to and what it is that he's guiding us into. We'll see him working in our lives in powerful ways. Even more than that, it's great. We're going to spend eternity with him, but we can even see him hanging out with us now. But it has to start with admitting that there's something in your heart that isn't pure. B, A, admit. B, believe. Believe that God can actually purify your heart. Now, we don't have enough time today, this week, this month, even this year to list all of the truly awful things that I've done in my past. It's a long list. Um, In fact, I've probably forgotten more of the impure things in my past than I can even remember here right now. And that's a problem because what it is that you forget can still hurt you. Um, And and I know people who have tried all sorts of different things to try to make it right. You know, they, 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 but... (sighs) Have you guys remember uh, the... The, uh, how many of you are Marvel fans? Black Widow. Any, anybody remember Black Widow from Marvel? And, and she has this thing that just drives her trying to remove the red in her ledger. Right? But it can't be done. It isn't done by doing good things. Um, I, uh, and what it is that we've forgotten in our past can still hurt us today. Uh, one of the, I'll never forget, I was uh, at a conference with a fellow and uh, we were just talking and they told me the saddest story that I ever heard. He, uh, the year prior, had lost his five-year-old son to a gunshot injury because he forgot to lock his gun safe. What it is that you've forgotten can still hurt you. And just because you've forgotten about some of the things that you've done in your past, man, they can still come around and hurt you. Sin is like that. We can try to modify our behavior. We can try to get professional help. We can, we can buy tens of the thousands of self-help books that are out there. But if we don't believe that God can cleanse our heart, we're hooped. It doesn't matter how much you good, you can't purify yourself. A little poop wrecks the soup. Even if you worked really hard, spent uh, spent all of your time trying to do things, you can never purify that heart. Only God can do that. And the good news is it's absolutely free. Romans 6.23 says, uh, we remember uh, it, it began for the wages of sin is death, but it finishes off with this. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this sounds way too good to be true. I mean, I'd be highly suspicious if I ran into a Black Friday deal that says completely free, right? How many times have you clicked on something on the internet that was completely free, we want to give this to you, and instead you got inundated by spam, or here's a free virus for you now, right? Nothing is free in this world. We need to be aware of when somebody is trying to sell us something that is free or give us something that is free, it's always got a catch, right? 
It may say free, but it always costs. Didn't, didn't something have to be, if, if I'm getting a, a free gift from God, didn't something have to happen in order for it to be free? Who had to pay? Well, it's true. God had to pay. He paid the price that your heart could be made pure. He paid the price in full. Jesus, who lived a perfect life, suffered a horrific death in order to pay my wages. He died for you and your heart's impurities. See, God knows the situation. He knows what it is that's going on in our life. He knows our hearts are impure, and he knows the implications of that. We live apart from him in our lives, and then we live apart from him for eternity. But he so very much wants to be a part of our life. He desperately loves you and wants to connect with you. So he made a way for it, and it cost him a ton. He wants to connect with you and be with you. So God took an extraordinary step. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. And he sacrificed himself on the cross. Died in the most horrific way they could ever come up with. To pay for your stupid choices. And if we believe, he'll make our heart pure. Now so far, we've outlined a, a couple of steps. Admit of what it is that's going on. And then believe in our heart. Then it's C. I have to commit my heart fully to God. This is the, this is the easy part. Oh no, we love the admit part. It's pretty easy. Just talk a little bit. The believe part, oh yeah, it's just something going on inside of my heart. This is where it is that the rubber meets the road, though. The commitment part. We believe that God can make me pure. We actually commit our lives to it. We give God our hearts the completeness of who it is that we are. We're in fact, what it is that we're really chewing, choosing to do here is the wages of sin is death, right? And what we're choosing to do is die now rather than later. We, we do what Jesus did. We lay down our life completely now for God. God laid down his life for us. We lay our life down for him. And we commit to fully living a life directed towards him and his plan for our life. Let's look at this verse, Romans 3, 22. We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sin. We can all be saved in this same way, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. That word trust, though, is so key. This is the final step to a pure heart. When, when I trust God enough to give him all of me completely, the nephes, the center, my desires, my passions, my will, the abilities that I've been given, when I use them all for God, when I turn it all completely over to him, that's when God enters your life completely and begins to transform you from the inside out. Trust and commitment are important steps. I mean, if somebody asked you out on a date, they're like, hey, would you go on a date with me? It's not really going to actually change you very much. But if somebody said, hey, will you marry me? That's going to change your life. Why? Because you're going to lay down your life for that other person daily. And that's going to change who it is that you are. And that, that act of daily recommitting to them to be who it is that they need you to be, to die to your selfish desires and instead live for theirs, it messes you up in the best of ways. You see, trusting God enough to open our hearts to him, allowing him to enter into our lives and purify our hearts, then allowing him to remain in control of our life is something that we get to choose daily. We die to ourselves daily. We pick up our cross daily. Die to who it is that we are and live for him. Look at this next verse, Revelations 3.20. It says, look, I've been standing at the door and I'm constantly knocking. 
If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and him with me. You see, God doesn't wait for you to figure out that you need him in your life. Thank goodness. Instead, he pursues you. He's going after you. He's on the outside of your heart, and he's knocking to be let in. He wants to enter your life. He wants to bring meaning into your life. He wants to purify your heart and transform you for something that he originally created you for, something special and dynamic. And I, I want you to experience eternity, sure. I want you to be with him after this life. But even more so, man, I want you to experience the power that is available to you. The presence of God that is available to you. The connection to him that is totally and completely available to you. But that means you've got to figure some things out in your mind, will, and emotions. You've got to figure some things out in your heart. Let's look at three different diagrams. And sorry, I am terrible at art. Uh, please forgive me. Um, how many of you know that Christ isn't Jesus' last name? <laughs> it was his title, right? It's Christ Lord. It's Christ Ruler. It's Christ King. That's what Christ means. Uh... I think every one of our lives are going to fit into one of three different uh, diagrams here. The first one we're, we're going to call the self-directed life. And, and I believe that the majority of people in the world live in, in this self-directed life. This is the life where God is on the outside. And, or, or, or sorry, God is, God is on the outside. Christ is on the outside. And he's never been let into our life. Um, the second diagram, it's called the, the self-directed Christian life. And especially after the last two years, I believe that about 90% of Christians live in this one. They fit into this category. Because if you look, Christ is in their life. They, they've accepted God at some time. They prayed a prayer. They invited God into their life. They, you know, they, they believed that they had a problem. And, they, and, uh, and so they admitted that they had a problem. They believed that God was. They invited him into their life. But then they just kind of like sideline him over and over and over again. They're not willing to actually relinquish control of their life. Or at least some areas inside of their life. Yeah, God, I want you in my life, but don't try to tell me what it is that I should do with my time. God, I want you in my life, but don't try to tell me what it is that I should do with my money. God, I want you in my life, but don't try to tell you, don't try to tell, I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to allow you to have control of what it is that I do with my thought life or, or my sex life or, or, or my spare time. Yeah, they, they, they're going to be with God in heaven, and that's fantastic and great, but currently they're separated from God's presence in their life. They're separated from God's power in their life because their lives are impure. Now let's take a look at the last diagram. The last picture, we call this one the Christ-directed life. And this is a picture of a heart that is fully and completely, totally sold out, committed to God. Where God is made king, and we're committed to him, and so we're submitted to him. This person isn't perfect, because none of us are. This person has impurities in their life, but what they do is they repent, ask forgiveness, and learn quickly. They struggle against becoming a part of the world. They work to make sure that God is put on his throne. They battle to give God control of their life. They know that, that they still sin, but they're continually asking God, help me with this, Father. I want to die to that sin today. It's the happiest life. It's the life that is the most fulfilling and joy-filled life that you could possibly have. This person is living out God's best for their life. So where are you at? What's the state of your heart? God wants to give you a pure heart today. All you have to do is admit that there's something in there that needs to change. Believe that God can change it and then commit your life to allowing him to do so. 
you'll begin to experience a life different. And sure, life in eternity as well. Let's pray. Father, you've, you've shown us something in our life here this morning. You've, uh, you've made us aware that there is something going on in our life, an impurity of some kind. Whether it's a sexual impurity, whether it's a, a timeline impurity, a money impurity, a um, reading, the way what it is that we choose to read impurity, what we choose to watch impurity, whether it's a distraction impurity, where we're just so busy with what it is that we want to do with our life that we've forgotten that it isn't our own. Father, we admit that it's in there. And we believe that what it is that Christ did on the cross can change it. And now the hard part, Father, we commit to putting you on your throne. We commit to putting you first place in our life. We commit to bringing everything underneath what it is that your word says for us. And we're not going to have it all completely figured out, and we're going to stumble, we're going to fall, but Lord, we're going to get up and wrestle once again. Wrestle for your goodness in our life, your purity in our life. Father, please forgive us. And I thank you that you make us brand new. That even right now you are doing a work inside of our heart. You're making us fresh and new. That we're once again dying to the old self and living new in you. And that brings such joy. Help us tap into that often. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.